Well, uh, hello everybody and uh, thank you for all attending. Um, my name is Ennis Delmage. I'm a consultant in adolescent forensic psychiatry and I've been asked to talk to you about uh, PTSD. So uh, when Tony first asked me to uh, talk about this to you guys, um, I thought there would be money involved. Um, I've done some investigations and there isn't any money involved, but um, I've had a lifelong dream to be a firefighter, so here I am. Um, I've only been held back so far by my fear of small spaces, large spaces, uh, the colour red, uh, water and fire. Um, but apart from that, yeah, I, I'm on track. Um, so I'm going to try and talk about uh, a bit about the diagnosis and how it functions um, and also about um, methods of treating um, PTSD. Um, I've got a short video as well at the end. Um, and I've tried to keep this relatively short because I'm interested in feedback from other people about their experiences and perhaps um, colleagues that may have gone through uh, similar experiences. So, um, PTSD, uh, what is it? I did this presentation for a, a medical student just to try it out because we test everything on our medical students. Uh, and she said, well, it was a good presentation, but at no point did you define what PTSD stood for. So I thought, ah. Good, so post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, so as the title implies, there's normally some kind of traumatic event that um, uh, can set off a, a stress reaction and that can be a repeated experience for the sufferer. Uh, so uh, these are the diagnostic criteria. So we've got a, a re-experiencing of the trauma that's occurred uh, via vivid uh, intrusive memories, uh, flashbacks to the experience. Uh, that's kind of conscious reliving of the experience. Uh, and nightmares um, are, are pretty common as well. And this can occur through any of the senses. It's not just visual, it can be smells, uh, it can be touch sensations, um, uh, auditory sensations uh, uh, can be part of that reliving experience. Um, and usually accompanied by very strong, a very strong emotional reaction and strong physical sensations too. So, um, uh, the individual normally experiences a tendency to try and avoid those thoughts, so uh, they will make efforts to avoid the topic or triggers that might um, start off the thought processes. Uh, memories of the event are also aversive and people will just try not to think about what's happened to them. Uh, they'll often try and avoid the location, so if it was in a particular area they may make efforts to not go to that area for whatever reason. Uh, and um, any other triggers that might be around that, that might um, start off the memory. Um, you also get this state of hypervigilance which is a kind of generalised anxiety state where people are just on high alert and you can often pick this up if you drop something nearby uh, and people will, you know, like cat-like reactions will, will catch it so that's a sort of um, uh, high startle response or high sort of um, high alert state. Um, so a generalised anxiety uh, may accompany this, um, this disorder. Uh, you can get memory loss for, for parts or sometimes all of the event um, uh, which, which triggered the PTSD in the first place uh, and it's normally of several weeks duration and um, we often find a significant impairment of personal, family, social or occupational functioning. So, so that's the diagnostic criteria laid out as we would, we would use it to, uh, to make the diagnosis in individuals. Um, this bit at the bottom, I guess, is the most important for most of us. So how is it going to have an impact on our personal lives, our relationships? Uh, how is it going to have an impact on how we are with our kids or um, our friends? Uh, and also what impact will it have on our, on our jobs? Uh, and if you're in a traumatic um, profession, talking to the converted, uh, you know, this is um, particularly salient. Um, so there was some research which I tried to dig out for this presentation but couldn't quite find it about um, PTSD in um, first responders uh, in terms of ambulance uh, drivers and nurses and doctors in, in ED. And the end result was interesting which is that PTSD was much more common in the first responders that were actually going out to the scenes of accidents than it was in the ED um, staff. And the authors concluded that uh, possibly the, the reason was that the, uh, if you're in ED, everything's very predictable. You know which bay is which, you know where the bloods are. If you see someone with a you know, gunshot wound or you know, is bleeding out through an um, RTA or whatever, uh, you ring the surgeon, you know how to get the cross-matched blood. It's all pretty predictable and contained. Uh, so however horrible the thing is that's on the gurney, 
the rest of it, you know what to do. You kind of, you know, you've got your strategy and, um, and it's all very kind of predictable environment. Whereas being a first responder out in the community, you're going to see some horrific things in a completely alien environment with lots and lots of stimulus going on. So uh, it seems to have a kind of more traumatic resonance with, with people that are actually um, uh, on the front line, so to speak. So, uh, what else is PTSD? Uh, well, we've talked about this sense of generalised anxiety and a, and a feeling of unease. Um, physical symptoms can be part of PTSD, so tiredness, headaches, um, people can get stomach ulcers through stress and not eating properly, uh, and even things like paralysis of limbs can occur. Uh, that's not a neurological paralysis, that's a psychological paralysis, but it has the same impact. It means you can't use your arm or your leg or what have you. Um, so you, you can get some physical symptoms and often those are the only symptoms people sometimes will not get any of the obvious nightmares and flashbacks but they may start experiencing these these physical uh, uh, symptoms um, so PTSD it's inevitable if you repeatedly expose anyone to trauma uh, even if you're Superman or James Bond um, and there's been some interesting research on this thing called courage uh, so the, the original researchers, the, the idea was that um, there may be a certain personality type or a certain uh, gender or age or you know ethnicity that, that may be particularly courageous and this is what the researchers set out to find and they didn't find that they found that courage is just you know it can be present in a you know 89 year old Vietnamese lady or a 15 year old uh, Swiss, uh, Swiss schoolboy or you know it just didn't seem to have any pattern in terms of the individual but what they did find was everyone's got a certain amount of courage and once you've exhausted that courage you're then in a, in a bad state where you're constantly anxious and really not able to to cope very well. Uh, some people have got more of that and some people have got less but it's finite so even if you're James Bond like I said with this much courage once it's gone it's, it's gone. So uh, PTSD is, it can be hard to spot in others. People can get pretty good at masking the symptoms of stiff upper lip and pretending everything's okay. Uh, and um, yeah, so it can, be, it can be difficult to pick up in other people and it can be hard to spot in yourself too. So um, as we've talked about with those physical symptoms, it can present in odd ways that you wouldn't immediately anticipate. Uh, it is a cause of loss of job, divorce, drug and alcohol problems and uh, sadly suicide as we'll go on to uh, discuss so we need to take it seriously and it has a lifetime prevalence of about 3.6% in men and 9.7% in women that's uh, from a study in the States. I, I don't know why that gender split is there I suspect it's because the women are better at seeking help whereas the men are just you know suffering in silence and not telling anybody. Um, but uh, if you look at New Zealand specifically, in according to the World Health Organization, uh, you're looking at about 6.1% across genders, so that's just a New Zealand average. Does anybody know who this is? Shakespeare? Yeah, spot on. So this is William Shakespeare. Um, and here is a, a sonnet, so I thought I'd regale you with a bit of Shakespeare being British as I am. Uh, so tell me, sweet lord, what is it that takes from thee thy stomach pleasure and thy golden sleep? Why dost thou bend thine eyes upon the earth and start so often when thou sitst alone? Why hast thou lost the fresh blood in thy cheeks, in thy faint slumber's eye by thee, have watched and heard thee murmur tales of iron wars? Thy spirit within thee hath been so at war, and thus hath so bestirred thee in thy sleep, that beads of sweat have stood upon thy brow. And in thy face strange motions have appeared, such as we see when men restrain their breath. Some heavy business hath my lord in hand, and I must know it, or else he loves me not. So there you go, Henry IV. Um, so, uh, I probably don't need to point this out, I would guess, but um, lack of eating. Again, appetite's gone, probably some mood problem going on. Anhedonia, we call that psychiatrically, loss of pleasure, not enjoying life. Sleep problems, we talked about nightmares pretty commonly. So this is a, a description of someone that had been at war, and this is the wife's description of, of what the chap was like. Uh, lack of eye contact, so self-esteem issues. Um, uh, st uh, starting often when you, uh, the person is alone, that's the startle reflex we mentioned, the hypervigilance. Um, why hast thou lost fresh blood in thy cheeks, so pallor. Um, uh, in thy faint slumbers I by thee have watched and heard thee murmur tales of iron wars. Again, that's probably the nightmares going on there. Uh, thy spirit within thee hath been so at war and thus hath so served thee in thy sleep that beads of sweat have stood upon thy brow. That's an uh, adrenaline response. Um, 
Uh, and in thy face strange motions have appeared, such as we see when men restrain their breath. So this is uh, sort of panic experiences. Uh, some heavy business hath my Lord in hand, and I must know it else he loves me not. So there's your relationship impact of PTSD. Um, so, uh, good old um, Shakespeare. Um, it's a sort of harder reference to get. I don't know if anyone would spot this. Um, so this is a statue of um, Gilgamesh. Um, uh, and this is probably the first reference that I could find of PTSD. Uh, this is um, from 2100 BC. Um, and Gilgamesh was the king of Uruk in Mesopotamia. Uh, and Gilgamesh's friend uh, Enkidu was killed in front of him in a sort of gory fashion. Uh, and he then had nightmares and flashbacks to this experience and discussed them. And this is written in the, in the book. So uh, what does Gilgamesh do? Well, instead of seeking help or talking to people, he does the male thing and goes on a big quest. Uh, and he's seeking out eternal life as a sort of philosophical um, um, uh, anxiety, I suppose. Um, and he fails to find eternal life, but the quest itself gives his life meaning. You can imagine the film rights kind of um, uh, do themselves. Uh, and the, the sort of uh, uh, conclusion is that the fear of death was actually a fear of being meaningless and he wanted a sort of purpose in, in life. Um, so there you go, the first account we had of uh, PTSD and it actually was probably, we think, the oldest ever piece of literature in the world. Um, so the first book ever written uh, uh, covered um, PTSD, uh, yeah, the Epic of Gilgamesh. So there you go. Um, Here's a more modern example. This is a chap called Ronnie McNutt who was in the newspapers recently. Uh, sad story, a 33-year-old army veteran uh, who suffered with PTSD following active service uh, in Iraq. Uh, he'd recently broken up with his girlfriend and he'd been drinking heavily. Uh, and Ronnie uh, live-streamed his suicide on Facebook uh, at the end of August this year. Uh, the clips went, went viral uh, across platforms and um, as tends to happen with these things, fake backstories emerged about this chap, uh, which, which were you know, obviously very distressing for his friends and family. Uh, and the, the thinking was that uh, automated software uh, might have been responsible for the spread. Um, and essentially this software will pick up when things are becoming viral phenomena and will sort of latch on and, and um, uh, uh, inflame the kind of response, if you like. Um, uh, these bots are interesting uh, and we think maybe kind of um, looking to how, how to destabilize populations or, or testing Facebook as a platform for its um, security. Um, but anyway, whichever um, the, the end result was that this story went, went viral and, um, uh, as I said, caused a lot of distress for his, um, his friends and family. Uh, media coverage of, of suicide does, uh, does tend to increase base rates of suicide. So if you get a high profile suicide, you often then get kind of copycat episodes. Um, um, so yeah, it can be quite a widespread phenomena. Uh, and I'd, I'd written this um, presentation uh, and um, uh, thought I was done and dusted with it a couple of months ago. And then there was another case which came through the news, which um, uh, also tragic. So this is a chap called Sam Bull. Sam is on the left there, that's his dad on the right. Uh, he was involved in a, in a helicopter crash uh, and um, uh, survived, but it was a very traumatic experience for him and he unfortunately committed suicide in October this year. Um, and he'd, he'd been working hard to save four of the um, uh, other people in the helicopter, but unfortunately they drowned. Um, so Sam suffered with survivor guilt. Um, which again, um, frontline people are also uh, prone to at times, um, and there is an overlap with PTSD and this notion of survivor guilt. Does everyone know what survivor guilt is? That sort of sense that why didn't I succumb? Everyone else, you know, died and I didn't, and why am I worthy? Sort of thing. Um, so, yeah. So I, I thought I'd mention just a little bit about the history of um, PTSD and how we learnt about it. Um, War, unfortunately, was, was how this uh, uh, became a thing. Um, so the first descriptions of uh, this PTSD phenomena uh, um, was uh, uh, shell shock, um, soldier's heart, combat fatigue and war neurosis. Uh, shell shock being quite literally when shells were going off, they thought that the explosion and the shock wave was causing some kind of brain damage that was um, uh, causing the condition. Uh, and soldier's heart, again, it was thought to be maybe cardiac as well. They weren't quite sure because some of the symptoms were heart racing, palpitations, that kind of thing. Uh, so they thought there was maybe a kind of physical origin to it. 
so in the 1600s, um, uh, Dr. Johannes Herfer, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, um, uh, coined the term nostalgia in Swiss soldiers, and you can understand why nostalgia might have been an apt term because these people were constantly looking back to uh, trauma that they'd experienced. Uh, and then similar accounts um, emerged from um, uh, frontline medics um, uh, in German, French and Spanish uh, troops. Uh, so this thing, nostalgia, was uh, uh, quite a common diagnosis during the Euro US Civil War uh, in 1861. Um, and after the Civil War, a Dr. De Costa uh, uh, coined the term soldier's heart or irritable heart, uh, as I said, because of those physical symptoms. Um, Again, it came to prominence in the 1800s in uh, the US um, uh, in survivors of railway accidents, which um, uh, were, were pretty common in the days before health and safety regulations. Uh, and again, railway spinal, railway brain indicates that we thought there was a physical uh, sort of um, skeletal problem that was going on that may be causing some of these symptoms. Uh, so along came World War One. Uh, and uh, Captain Charles Myers of the Royal Army Medical Corps uh, coined the term shell shock at that point, uh, thinking it was a brain concussion uh, phenomenon. Uh, and in World War I, there were 80,000 cases reported in the, um, the British Army of, of this condition of shell shock. Uh, advent of World War II, uh, we then had the more sophisticated description of combat stress reaction. Uh, and this was actually the cause of 50% of the military discharges through the course of World War II. Um, and similarly, I, I think people will know um, that there were high rates of suicide among returning general infantry from, uh, from Vietnam. Um, so uh, PTSD became a formally recognised diagnosis in, in the 1980s. Um, uh, and the subjects that they used to, uh, to help them form this diagnosis came from, uh, partly from Holocaust survivors from um, Germany and Poland uh, and also um, victims of sexual trauma and rape uh, who, who would report similar uh, symptoms. So they realised that there was this grab bag of people that had nightmares, flashbacks, anxiety, poor sleep, physical symptoms and they thought well there's something in common with this, with this group that they've, they've got very similar symptoms and have been through uh, just different types of trauma uh, and as I mentioned there was a, a clear overlap established with um, survivor guilt. So um, does PTSD have to be triggered by something major? Uh, no is the short answer. It can be a relatively minor stimulus which can trigger off PTSD. It may be that someone's been repeatedly traumatised in small ways and then another small trauma comes along and that, that sets it off. Um, we, we normally think of survivors of plane crashes or buildings collapsing or whatever it might be as, as um, being the obvious um, uh, victims of PTSD but it, but it can be repeated trauma over long periods or, or something relatively minor. Uh, it can be a major stimulus but delivered in a minor way, so uh, there was quite a moving account in a, a UK documentary about a soldier who um, uh, had control of one of these um, aerial drone type things and he had a small screen about that big with a grainy black and white image on it and his job was to fly this drone and identify enemy combatants and he'd found a jeep. Uh, and in the jeep he was pretty sure there was four enemy combatants so um, uh, at the opposite moment he pressed a button and down comes the rocket and the jeep is obliterated. So all he's got is this tiny screen like this and that was all that happened. He pressed a button, puff of smoke, that was it, uh, the jeep was gone. Uh, and he had uh, very um, severe PTSD as a result of that experience because he knew that his actions had just immediately ended the lives of these four individuals and just couldn't process. Uh, um, couldn't process the experience really. Uh, or uh, the, the obvious one would be a, a major stimulus um, and uh, the, the flashbulb memory of my lifetime would have been 9-11. Um, older generations will remember JFK and that's what we call a flashbulb memory. So a flashbulb memory is something that's so major and so traumatic that it just gets burned into your um, retina if you like so I can recall exactly where I was when I was watching the news and the you know footage came off of, of, the, of the Twin Towers um, I can remember what weather it was like which people were around me I was doing a rehab psychiatry job and the patients and the staff were all crowded around the TV in the lounge area so that that we would call a flashbulb memory it's so out of the ordinary and so major that um, uh, it just kind of gets burned into your brain really 
So how do you predict it? Um, um, so uh, this was a, a quote from um, uh, one of my favourite philosophers, Mike Tyson, um, also a PTSD sufferer, uh, interestingly. Um, yeah, and I, I think it's salutary. It sort of ties in with that uh, John Lennon, you know, um, life's what happens when you're making other plans sort of thing. Um, uh, so, yeah, I think we, we just have to be humble and say, well, look, any of us could experience this, uh, this thing at any time. And it's, it's actually reasonably hard to predict um, uh, when it will occur or how it will manifest itself. Um, but certainly people that are in jobs where they're experiencing traumatic things on a regular basis are, are, are vulnerable uh, and need to have insight and be self-aware, I guess. So, um, no friend of Mike Tyson, but does anyone know who this is? Thank you, Graham. Um, yeah, this is um, Freud. Um, so uh, Freud had various theories about why PTSD uh, occurs. Um, and Freud said, well, the brain is essentially uh, trying to retrospectively prepare itself um, for the trauma that happened. Uh, because when the trauma did happen, it was caught off guard and hadn't made preparations <coughs> and was therefore, you know, um, badly damaged and so it retrospectively attempts to to prepare itself by being on high alert at all times um, you know sort of hyper vigilance um, and the flashbacks themselves may represent an internal attempt to habituate the brain to trauma so habituation is a pretty common um, CBT technique um, uh, so I shouldn't tell you this story, but um, when I was a, a junior doctor, I, I worked in a big shared office with uh, a nurse and um, uh, she and I used to play tricks on each other and she hated wasps. She had a real terrible phobia of wasps. So I used to put pictures of wasps on a desktop. I used to put dead wasps in a drawer. Um, uh, and the, the, my crowning moment was I found this giant wasp and teddy bear and I put it in a chair and she turned it around and there it was. Frightened her. And I, I didn't like spiders, so my desk was just plastered in pictures of spiders that she'd found. She'd put them in my diary in there, and there'd be this uh, little rubber spiders would fall down on me and all, all sorts of horrible things. But so my, my desk was just plastered in these pictures of spiders, and I was thinking, oh, this is, you know, quite annoying. They're all very disturbing images. Um, but I, there were so many of them that I thought, I can't take all these pictures down. It's, it's ridiculous. Uh, and the weird thing was, after about a week, I stopped being afraid of spiders because I was just so used to seeing them. It, it just became uh, a kind of... And then I also kind of got into gardening around the same time, and you can't hate spiders. If you're into gardening, they're just everywhere. So that's habituation. It's just constant... Um, um, stimulus that, that kind of um, eventually you, you just your anxiety response kind of goes down and you're okay with them um, so don't don't test me out though please um, so uh, it may be that the flashback experiences are part of the brain's attempt to do that to habituate us through through um, repeated exposure uh, and uh, in evolutionary terms it's a pretty obvious survival mechanism if you're in an environment where traumatic things are happening regularly it's good to be on high alert because you're more likely to um, uh, to survive than others, um, so there is an evolutionary advantage. Um, and that process of, of working through the trauma in a non-threatening situation, um, uh, you know, maybe a sort of method of doing that processing that you just couldn't do at the time when the trauma was happening because it was too live and too difficult and, not, and just not a safe place to do it. Um, yeah, so what's happening to the body? Uh, physiologically, I'm sure Graham could tell you all of this, but um, we have a stimulus which mirrors the trauma, which may be external, someone says something or you see an image on TV or the loud noise or whatever it might be, or, or it could be internal, you get an internal sensation which reminds you of, of what you've been through. Uh, and then we have the amygdala, which is the sort of emotion processing center in the, in the middle of our brains. Uh, and that's what's responsible for our fight and flight reaction. The adrenaline kind of gets released and, and we, we go on high alert. Um, you then get a dumping of glucose into the bloodstream. That's one of the things adrenaline does because it says get ready to run off or uh, attack somebody. So you need plenty of sugar for your muscles. Uh, so you get this glucose dumping. Uh, cortisol release, which is your stress hormone, uh, which gets you on, on high alert, and uh, altered blood flow. Um, and so the blood's going to your muscles and away from your stomach because you don't need to be eating when you're attacking somebody or running off. You, you just need to be kind of, um, it's game time. 
uh, tachycardia, so your heart starts beating quickly, uh, you start breathing very quickly, you're sweating, your muscles are very irritable and twitchy, so if this happens when you're sitting down, you often get people fidgety and, you know, uh, um, maybe standing up a little bit. Uh, nausea, because all that blood's gone away from your stomach, so the food that's in there isn't going anywhere, it's just sitting around and being mulched. Uh, and pupillary dilatation, so your pupils widen so you can see everything as well as possible and you can kind of be alert. Uh, and then you get a slow remission period over, over minutes or sometimes it can take hours for that adrenaline level to sort of drop down, the cortisol to drop down. Um, so that would represent a discrete episode, um, but you can also get this generalised anxiety where you get these ebbs and flows of uh, adrenaline uh, and hyperarousal and hypervigilance. So uh, here's a picture which says the same sort of thing really. Uh, we've got uh, saliva flow decreases, so people report dry mouth, um, pupillary dilatation, uh, fast breathing, uh, food movement slows down and bowel movement slows down. Uh, apart from right down the other end when you can often get diarrhea if you're in a very terrifying situation. Um, blood vessels um, will um, change diameter uh, and you can get a blood pressure increase as the major vessels are dilating. Uh, we've got um, blood vessels in the skin constricting so you might get chills and sweating, fast heartbeat, um, the output of digestive enzymes decreases and your muscles become more tense. Uh, so these are the uh, adrenal glands, uh, adrenal, sitting above the renal, uh, the kidneys, which are in there. Um, and that's where your adrenaline is uh, largely coming from. So hopefully you recognise this organ. This is the brain. Uh, and there are various bits that I suppose are interesting with PTSD. The frontal lobe, this is where we think personality sits. So this is judgment, decision making, impulse control. Um, processing of you know complex situations, executive functioning, so planning of how you might approach a difficult situation. Uh, the hippocampus, which is in here, uh, which is uh, memory, so that's when you're getting your flashbacks and your nightmares and you're reliving the event, it's, uh, uh, that system's involved. And then the limbic system, which is your emotional, a bit higher, which is your emotional processing bit. So the memory is triggering frontal lobe um, uh, processes of thinking about the, the trauma and then you're getting the amygdala response and then you get the adrenal response and the cortisol and then you're on high alert really. Um, yeah. So, um, so what? Why do we treat PTSD? Well, um, it's associated with quite a lot of problems. High blood pressure, high stroke incidents, chronic insomnia, which itself can cause car crashes and you know, plane crashes if you're a uh, pilot, um, uh, heart attacks, MIs, uh, obesity, uh, and drug and alcohol problems, uh, and of course suicide we've uh, talked about. Um, uh, wider than the sort of biology, you've also got things like family breakdown, loss of jobs, uh, car crashes just due to inattention and fatigue and, um, yeah, as we've mentioned, increased rates of suicide. So what do we do? Well, uh, th this biopsychosocial approach is the right answer to any medical student question about psychiatry. Um, they, al they always are programmed to say, I would take a biopsychosocial approach and that, that kind of covers all bases and lets us know that you're, um, you're probably going to pass your attachment. Um, so biopsychosocial, bio being biological, psycho being psychological and social being social. Um, so you're looking at things quite holistically if you can do. Uh, so biological, we do use medication for PTSD. Uh, there's a whole range of um, uh, antidepressants, so that's sertraline, fluoxetine, citalopram, those are serotonin um, reuptake inhibitors. Uh, propranolol, which is a beta blocker. Prazosin, which is an alpha blocker, so these are anti-anxiety, and then benzodiazepines, you'll have heard of things like Valium um, and that kind of drug. Um, uh, so we can use medication for them. Um, psychological, uh, CBT I mentioned before, that's the cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, this uh, is quite an appealing therapy, I think, to most people. It's got a really good evidence base because it's very easy to do research on it. It's very practical. So the typical PTSD sufferer would be uh, a businessman who comes in and says, look, I've got this thing and I just want you to fix it. I don't want any uh, airy-fairy Freudian stuff. I don't want to tell you about my childhood. I just want you to fix me so I can go back to work. Um, so uh, I had a chap that I was working with in the UK and he had a brain tumour and... Um, 
Uh, the tumour had been removed successfully and he had to go for um, serial MRI scans of his head. And back in those days you had to keep your head absolutely still for the scan to work. If you didn't then it was ruined and they had to start again. So it's about a half an hour procedure, the this, this scan. And the means of keeping his head still was to put a plastic face mask on him which fixed his head in one position, right? So he's got a couple of nose holes he can breathe through his nose but uh, he can't move his head otherwise. And uh, the nurse says to him, uh, here's a button, and if you're feeling anxious at any point during the scan, press the button, and we'll stop, we'll pause it, and we can have a cup of tea and have a break, and then come back and we'll do the rest, and he says, great. So the nurse goes off and uh, promptly goes to the toilet and, and meets a friend and, and doesn't come back in for about 20 minutes. And this chap is in the, uh, w with his face mask on, and he suddenly starts to think to himself, what if I'm sick? Uh, if I'm sick, I've got this mask on, it's got these two small nose holes, I may choke to death on my vomit, and this is pretty awful. So he's stuck in this mask, so he starts pressing the button and nobody comes, and his anxiety level just goes up and up and up until at the end of it he's, he's a gibbering wreck. So he comes and sees me in clinic, and what, what happened after that uh, experience was um, he'd gone off to stay in a, in a cottage with his wife, and the owner of the cottage, this is a terrible fire safety um, uh, strategy, but the owner of the cottage said, we've had a few burglaries, I'm going to lock the cottage door at night, so you're not going to be able to get out. There's a bathroom in the cottage, you'll be fine. In the morning, I'll come and lock it, uh, unlock it at 8 o'clock, and then you can go. And the wife thinks, oh, it's a bit weird, but fine, okay, off we go to bed. And the husband starts freaking out because he thinks, I can't get out, I can't escape, and starts feeling very claustrophobic and, and very anxious. The next thing that happens to him is he's driving to work and as he's driving to work he's stuck in a long line of traffic and he suddenly starts to think, I've got cars in front of me, I've got cars behind me, I've got cars, I can't get out, there's cars next to me, I can't, I, you know, and the panic again starts to, to, to raise. So uh, awful experience for this guy and again successful businessman just wanted this to be fixed really. Uh, so we did CBT with him and we gave him homework projects and, and he was just a dream patient. He would laminate the, you know, his homework and bring it into me and uh, always attended on time. He was, he was, he was great and um, sure enough he, he got better, uh, better pretty quickly with that, with that approach. So it's a very effective uh, treatment CBT. Uh, and it again, you know, asks you to sort of test out your hypotheses and you give them little homework projects to do uh, and they can build up their tolerance to um, uh, the sort of noxious stimulus. Um, EMDR is interesting, I will talk about that in a second, that's uh, eye movement desensitisation and reprocessing, you can see why we call it EMDR. Um, and computer games, which is very close to my heart, um, uh, is another method of, of uh, treating um, PTSD. So you can visualise and put somebody actually back in the situation without them actually being in it. Uh, and war would be a very obvious one. There's so many war computer games out there um, these days. Um, and we're also now using VR headsets, again, to really entrench somebody in the reality of it. And again, that's things like graded exposure, habituation, um, testing out, um, um, and our, um, we've got a video which we'll talk about that as well. Uh, so that's your psychological bit and the social bit, um, marital therapy, very important. Uh, and some of that has a psychoeducation component, so it's about understanding what your partner's going through uh, and, and realising that this isn't, you know, complete breakdown, but is, is something that's probably treatable. Um, support groups, very helpful for people that have been through similar things. Um, and vocational support, again, within mental health services, fortunately, we're pretty good at looking after each other and uh, supporting each other. Uh, and all, you know, organisations where you're on the front line should have similar mechanisms for, for support. Um, benefits, again, of course, it's important if you're off work for any period of time and ACC claims. Um, uh, and yeah, as I mentioned, psychoeducation of the network that's around the individual so that um, everyone's on the same page. So uh, CBT, uh, best evidence base in terms of psychological therapies. Um, and one of the techniques is exposure therapy. So you can ask the patient to imagine uh, and sort of you can get them to relive the experience in front of you uh, or do more indirect things like drawing and writing about the experience um, or go with them to visit the place that, where the traumatic memory is linked um, or, or again meet with people that might trigger the response. Um, as I mentioned, we do use VR headsets um, and you often will start small, so you'll start with a very, very innocuous stimulus and then build up gradually rather than flooding someone with a, with a sort of very traumatic thing straight away. 
we have a process of desensitisation um, and that tends to lead to a reduction in that stress hormone, the cortisol, and a, a reduction in the adrenaline response uh, and eventual habituation. And I've already talked about my spider example, so there we go, I'm ahead of myself. Uh, so what would Freud do? Um, well, uh, Freud was a brilliant chap and a lot of the um, theories are, are still around and um, as important now as they've ever been really. Uh, and Freud would look at um, reality testing, so consider um, your, your appraisal of what you actually did in that situation. Often people are carrying around a lot of guilt or um, blame and um, uh, so it's about reflecting on that really and um, yeah, just beginning to help the person reframe the experience. Um, and yeah, so a common question would be how, how reasonable are you being on yourself in the situation? You know, do you really think you could have done more? Do you really think things could have turned out differently and so on? Uh, EMDR, yeah, fascinating. So this is the eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. Um, uh, so essentially what you do is you have your patient sitting there and you get them to focus on a, on a task. And the typical one, we used to use a, a, a watch on a chain or a pendulum of some description, um, but now we've got these very fancy light bars which are about this long and I've got a light which will just move from one side to the other, a bit like Knight Rider in the old days, people remember that. So it's a big light bar like this and they have to keep their head still, but their eyes will track the movement of the bar. And during that tracking, you will talk to them about the uh, experience that's causing them anxiety. So um, you, you don't have to use a light bar. So for kids that aren't very good at keeping their head still, you can just tap on um, either side of their leg or their, either side of their arm. So that's another way of doing alternative brain side stimulus kind of thing. Um, uh, and yeah, the therapist will talk to the patient about the trauma um, and you, you aim for a reduction in anxiety and some sort of processing of the trauma whilst they're engaged in the, in the eye movement task. Um, we're not quite sure how it works, but it seems to change the brain's neural pathways by essentially associating the traumatic memory with uh, new non-threatening information, namely the sort of eye, eye movement process. Uh, so yeah, magic, we're not quite sure how it, how it works, but, um, uh, but it seems to. Uh, and it may be that it's, it's actually the reflection on the memories that's the important bit of the therapy rather than the expensive light bar, but um, uh, there you go. Uh, and the final, uh, oh, I think my final slide, um, animal therapy. This is my favourite because um, I work with kids and the kids love animals. Um, uh, so, yep, um, there's um, reasonable evidence with um, uh, canine assisted therapy and equine assisted therapy. Um, so we had a young person on the ward who had a, a very complex PTSD. She'd been traumatised in early life and um, she had a real affinity for horses. It was the one thing that would help her really calm down. Um, so um, I will pause there and uh, show you the video that I've got. And then um, I don't know how we're doing for time, but hopefully we've got time for a few questions at the end. Um, so it's not a very long clip, this, but I um, uh, thought it was um, reasonably germane. Well, in the 30 years I was on the department, this, this ended up being the big one. It just filled me up, overwhelmed me. Ward Redwood is a captain with the Grand Prairie Fire Department. Post-traumatic stress disorder nearly cost him a 30-year career. That's why he's decided to tell his story, starting with the night of the crash. It was a dynamic sight, the pulling on scene. There was a truck upside down in the middle of the road, and it was running and uh, it's a diesel truck, so it's saying they're running and just adds to things. The pickup had collided with the car, sending it into the ditch. Two teenagers were dead. A third boy was seriously injured in the passenger seat. There was no sign of the pickup driver. Redwood was using a thermal imaging camera to search the scene. As I'm moving it, a white image appears on the, on the camera and it was just like, I still remember it, it was just like this whole adrenaline thing went through me and it was just like, my brain said, that's a deer but I knew it was another boy. Redwood ran to the boy's body lying in the brush off the road, but found no pulse. I know I'm, I'm worked up, adrenaline's just pumping through me. I'm, uh, and I know that I still got a job to do, right? I found one, I'm like, I gotta keep looking. And it was within three, four seconds. I got another white signature on the, on the camera. Four boys, two 15-year-olds and two 16-year-olds died in that crash on October 22nd 2011. Grand Prairie rallied behind the family and friends of the teens, but Redwood 
tried to navigate the aftermath alone. You know, back in the day, that's all we did is with any trauma event like that is just pushed it down, tucked it away, didn't think about it, didn't talk about it. His marriage fell apart after the crash. He became a single dad. Life moved quickly and the crash faded to the background. That is, until a nightmare brought it roaring back five years later. The nightmare was wicked. It was really threw me. It was like these two boys' faces uh, looking up at me from, from down below and I was leaning over them and I had my flashlight kind of felt like something was wrong, <laughs> but couldn't put a finger on it. After the nightmare, he froze up twice on the job while using the thermal imaging camera. It felt like he was caught in quicksand. A psychologist told him it was workplace stress in too much coffee. But things only got worse from there. Sleepless nights, short attention span, memory problems. I was treading water a little bit. You know, I, was, I wasn't really doing a good front crawl. Some of my get up and go had gone. My enjoyment of things uh, uh, was starting to disappear a little bit. Redwood finally got a PTSD diagnosis, and soon after, the therapist said he was going to have to tackle the big one. I know what the big one is. I just don't want to deal with it, right? <laughs> Any stress response there while you're pointing the camera? No. Therapist Steve Buckle in Grand Prairie used prolonged exposure yeah, therapy. Yeah. Redwood told the story of the crash over and over again at times holding the camera he used to find the bodies. Take the tick camera, go up to fire ground command. And the therapy was grueling, recording the sessions and listening back to them. He was warned his symptoms would get worse before they got better, and they did. That part that concerned me for quite some time is, uh, you know, a big one, right? The uh, feeling of love had totally gone away and I had no feeling of love for quite some time, like years. On the seventh anniversary of the crash, another nightmare. Except this time, instead of the two boys, it's his two daughters looking up at him. And this one throws a switch in there. It just, oh. That one's a hard one to tell anybody about. Certainly can't tell my girls, but uh, I suck it up and I get back in there and we start getting at it and you know, from the night of the crash. Yeah, back. I get up to go and grab the medic, and, and then I'm like, whoa, I'm like, whoa, Steve, Steve. I said, I froze up. And he's like, what? I said, I froze up on scene. And the memory came back to me that I froze up. That same feeling, that quicksand feeling, I would actually did it on scene. And I, I'd repressed it. I didn't even know, I didn't. I had no memory of it whatsoever. And it, all of a sudden it came back. I was having a little trouble and I went and got some help. He could feel a change in himself. He was going back to the fire hall to have coffee with a crew, but he knew things had really turned a corner when he dropped his youngest daughter off at her mom's just two weeks later. Go to give her a hug before I leave and I have this full on feeling of love for her, which I haven't had for years. And it freaked me out. <laughs> it was like, I didn't say anything to her because she didn't know that I didn't have it. <laughs> I never told him that I didn't have it. Redwood went back to the fire hall part-time, but he had a choice to make, return to full service at the risk of more trauma or retire on his own terms. I'm happy, I'm healthy, I'm really enjoying life. To me, it was just time. And hopefully we're smarter in the future and look after ourselves better, I know we do. His last official day as a firefighter was on November 20th, but he hopes his story will be an example for all first responders, especially the thousands struggling with PTSD. It was emotionally draining and it was physically draining. Uh, it was every part of me hurt sometimes coming out of those, but it gets better. You just gotta put in that hard work. I hope they, they hear that and ask for help. Okay, so thanks to YouTube for that clip. It was a very generous um, uh, um, sufferer who, who really wants his message to be um, uh, to be heard. And um, yeah, so thank you very much. Are there any, any questions that anyone's got or any that have come through uh, 
via the phone and I'll do my best to answer them. Um, I think uh, we're hoping to put up some information about areas or methods of getting help for this kind of difficulty. Um, the obvious first port of call would be the GP. Um, GPs are great at being the gateways to lots of other services so they can um, certainly put you in touch with the right people uh, and there is an emergency number for Tihika which is our crisis team and if you're in real dire straits they're again a, a, a good group to, um, to ring and get support from uh, and they provide 24 hour a day. 365 days a year um, support um, and you'll you'll get a crisis nurse who will be on the front line but then there's also doctors as well who can who can see you um, out of hours um, so yeah those are the best methods to, to access support. Dennis we just had a question come in someone would love to hear your thoughts on vicarious trauma and accumulated stress trauma. Yeah, I mean, I think it, I would go back to the point I was making at the uh, sort of midway through that um, um, the, the trauma doesn't have to be directly experienced. It doesn't have to be uh, what we would call major trauma in the sense of you don't have actually have to have to have been there. Um, so, yeah, vicarious trauma is not uncommon experience for uh, healthcare workers to talk about because we're dealing with young people that have been through terrible experiences and often carrying those around is a sort of heavy thing to do. And uh, yeah, it, it's, it's a genuine uh, cause of burnout within uh, health services and I'm sure within um, your, your professions as well that you'll, you'll have you know, loved ones that you may relate to and talk about the, the sort of work experiences that you've had. So yeah, a, a genuine problem. I think vicarious trauma tends to present in slightly different ways. So that's more commonly um, manifested in psychological um, uh, avenues. So that could be generalized anxiety, panic attacks, that kind of thing. Um, whereas PTSD can be a bit more covert and a bit more hidden and clandestine and sort of harder to um, uh, to pin down. But um, yeah, a, a not uncommon problem within, um, uh, again, frontline staff, unfortunately. Why do you think people are so strange about this issue? I mean, I don't know if it's everybody, but I think firefighters are, are, are not very comfortable talking about it. I why that is. Yeah, I mean, I suppose there's some fairly obvious theories around uh, in terms of people feeling that they should be able to cope with these kind of things and that it's not um, macho or um, uh, professionally fitting to, to talk about it. Uh, I think what has helped is some very high profile and uh, famous people coming forward and talking about their experiences with PTSD. So Mike Tyson would be would be one example, but um, it, it's they, those kind of figures will enable other people, I think, to, to feel more empowered to um, to discuss it. But um, I, I mean, I think you know it, the, there is still a stigma attached to mental health problems in a, in a way that there clearly isn't with physical problems. If you'd broken your leg, sorry, Graham, broken your ankle, something similar, uh, you clearly wouldn't pretend that you hadn't, and you know, and suck it up and just carry on. You'd go and get help. But um, uh, even in the twenty um, first uh, century, we're still dealing with a, a fair amount of stigma, and so our colleges of psychiatry will do various campaigns to try and destigmatize mental health and put it on an equal footing, really, with physical health. Um, but the brain is a very complex organ uh, in a way that the kidney is perhaps not quite as complex. We kind of understand mostly how the kidney works, but the brain's got, you know, more uh, fundamental connections than there are particles in the universe. It's um, 200 billion or something. It, it's a yeah, very complex machine and um, it can break down in lots of interesting ways. But um, the important thing is that there are um, avenues of support and help out there which um, uh, are accessible if people, if people can make the first step of saying, I need help, I'm struggling. Mm. Um, I've got a question actually. If you feel that someone around you is actually suffering from PTSD, What's your best approach? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess it depends on how open that person is about their symptoms. If what they're presenting with is nightmares and um, they're saying, oh, you know, I'm struggling, I'm feeling stressed at the moment, but I'll, I'll, I'll be okay, you might need to do a bit of psychoeducation with them. So, um, again, there are avenues out there. GPs are going to be a pretty good source for, for, um, for garnering resources. Uh, and the internet, it can be a wonderful thing. So um, the Royal College website will have um, pamphlets, guidelines, um, information about um, mental disorders. The, the, the key bit though, I think, is, is insight and recognition and, and just naming what's going on. Um, and people will suffer in silence for a long time until it gets to a point where suddenly they can't do something. They literally can't go to work. And, and then that's often a sort of crisis point where they'll recognize there's a problem. Um, 
you know, the most sympathetic thing I think you can do is just listen and, and try to help them understand uh, as well that actually there may be an issue that's going on there and that it may be having an impact on the relationship or the relationship with the kids. The, the firefighter that was talking in the, in the video clip there I thought was very interesting with his description of his relationship with his daughters, mm -hmm. that he literally hadn't felt love for them. And for that to be an experience that you have as a parent is... Um, unthinkable for most of us to, to imagine that but it happened to that guy and it was again a kind of consequence that he was on high alert and just didn't have the brain power to do the emotional processing stuff with his daughters so um, I think when you start picking up warning signs like that it's about you know gently supporting your partner to understand that what's going on is treatable and um, uh, but, but a serious problem with some serious consequences if it's not dealt with. Mm. So is there a time frame in which it gets less likely that you'll be able to resolve um, PTSD from, from the traumatic event? Yeah, um, no, not as such. I mean, it, it's very, uh, there's a lot of individual variation. So um, the, the Vietnam War vets were, were a sort of good example of this, that some people, the symptoms manifested straight away. Some people it took, you know, six months. Some people it took years before they, they started experiencing symptoms. The, the good news is I think, you know, once you're symptomatic, there's stuff there that we can treat and we can treat it relatively quickly and simply with that biopsychosocial approach. So, um, yeah, the, the, the issue with PTSD is people naming it and coming forward and seeking help. Once they've done that, the rest is gravy. Do you know what I mean? You, 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 it's pretty straightforward from that point. It's just the issue of getting help in the first place. And that's the killer. You know, so the, the stories that we talked about with um, Sam Bull and Ronnie McNutt back in the, in the presentation, um, that they just weren't uh, receiving appropriate help really and um, it had just built up to a point where it was all consuming and, and unfortunately they, they could no longer tolerate it. So yeah, the, the, the issue is getting help. Once you've got someone with the symptoms in front of you, uh, as a therapist it's pretty straightforward to manage that with them. Mm. A question here from the text. What do you do if your GP doesn't recognise PTSD? Change your GP. I mean, I, I, the number of GPs out there that, that would not recognise it, um, I would hope is relatively small and it's been a pretty well established diagnosis for a long enough time now that um, um, people should be picking it up pretty quickly. Um, um, yeah, my only advice would be change the GP, get a different opinion from, uh, from somebody else that's perhaps a bit better informed in terms of mental health problems. But um, I mean, uh, yeah, as I said, I would hope that the number of GPs that are actually um, n not picking it up is relatively small. The, the challenge, of course, is that it can present in odd and interesting ways. So, you know, tiredness is a very common thing that people go to GP practices with. That can have any number of causes from anemia to malignancy to, you know, some strange infectious disease to COVID to um, PTSD. So, to the, you know, uh, th there are lots of potential causes and they may misdiagnose it. But I think once someone's got the pretty classic symptoms, the GPs should really be picking it up. Um, but I, as I said, I, I would um, be seeking a second opinion, really. I think if, if you're pretty clear that that's what's going on and the GP's just not acting on it, then um, you, you need to get a second view, really. Certainly, I wouldn't sit on it. Um, a question from me, uh, and it's, it could just repeat it back to you for people. Mm. Um, what, what's your sense of um, of how, how soluble it is as a problem? I mean, the chap in the video ended up having to quit being mm. a firefighter. That's, um, that's not a very attractive prospect for a lot of people. Like the no. No, and I, I think, I mean, that again, so j just to yeah, repeat your question, you were talking about the, um, uh, the resolution likelihood with, with this kind of disorder. Um, and, you know, I suppose whether it always has that trajectory of people having to leave work completely or whether you can resolve it and, and maintain your position. Um, again, I think it is very individualised. It does depend on that person's circumstances. Um, I think that chap had left it quite a long time before he, he um, uh, did manage to get appropriate help. Um, perhaps if that help had been more available earlier, um, uh, the outcome might have been different. Um, similarly, maybe there were other reasons for why he decided to, to retire. Uh, I think certainly for people that are young and want to maintain their position and aren't uh, even thinking about retirement, um, I, I would hope the outcomes are pretty good. I mean, in terms of mental disorders, um, uh, it is very amenable to CBT and um, we, we often combine that with medication uh, and 
Um, as I said, most of the patients that I've seen that we've, we've managed with PTSD will get a, um, a good degree of resolution to the point where it's no longer impairing their general functioning, um, daily living skills uh, and employment prospects and education prospects as well. So um, I, I would encourage people to access help as early as they possibly can do. Um, I think organisations are getting more and more sophisticated in terms of how they manage their workforce because of course they want to retain staff and not lose them. Um, so early interventions are becoming uh, more fashionable, uh, which is a positive thing. And again, we're recognising as part of what we're doing here is, is making sure it's on people's minds and we're, we're conscious of it. Um, so yeah, I think um, early access and um, engagement in something like CM, uh, CBT or EMDR um, plus some judicious use of medication uh, and I would be optimistic about resolution in most cases. So, um, what, what's your feeling on some of the newer treatments like microdosing and all that sort of stuff? Yes, so um, I have to be careful what I say here. There's a fair amount of controversy around um, microdosing. I mean, I, 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 uh, when I was a trainee, we used a fair amount of ketamine on patients that were in for eye surgery and just had a bit of local anesthesia. Um, uh, and that was what ketamine did, and we didn't really think of it. It was a horse tranquilizer, that's another use of it, and we didn't think of it beyond that. Now there is good evidence that it's very useful in depression. Uh, we've got, as you mentioned, sort of microdosing studies which look at um, drugs like LSD. There was a whole slew of research in the States about LSD in the 60s and 70s with pretty rubbish outcomes. You know, it was um, uh, discredited really as a treatment, but now it's kind of re emerging. Um, what I would say about it is the evidence base isn't there yet, um, but uh, the scientific position is we don't know, uh, which is the most frequent scientific position you'll find is we just don't know. Um, but uh, in contrast to things like CBT or um, uh, sertraline medications, whatever, where we can say actually there's a good evidence base for this, uh, at the moment with things like microdosing we don't have that. Um, things change very quickly though in terms of research, so if you'd asked me a year ago about ketamine I'd have said we don't know. Early trials look interesting, but we're not sure. And now it's an established treatment with uh, with depression. So, um, yeah, things can change pretty quickly in terms of research. Um, uh, notably, the COVID vaccine, which you know, fingers crossed, um, we're we're hoping um, uh, will be a goer. So, yeah, I, I think um, uh, the jury's out at the moment. But um, yeah, it looks interesting. Mm. Um, Tony's question and your answer partially answered mine as well. Um, so your views on the importance of uh, like an informal debrief after a moderate to serious incident at mm. the station. Sorry. Yeah, so Graham was asking about um, uh, the, the sort of merits of, of debriefs after, after incidents. I mean, I, um, I feel kind of quite passionately about this and really I think debriefs should happen after all incidents, uh, even if they're seemingly relatively minor, given what we talked about, that the stimulus doesn't have to be major, it can be minor things that have happened. Um, so I, I would be supportive of, uh, yeah, that kind of debrief process for, for all traumatic events. So if you look at what we're trying to do in hospitals uh, after restraints, where young people have had to be, uh, had to have physical support and restraint, we're trying to do debriefs after all of those so that people can talk about it. We get the same stiff upper lip approach in hospitals, so the support workers will say, oh, I just got punched in the face, it's fine, I'm going to carry on, I'm okay to work. Um, whereas actually they need to sit down and reflect a little bit on what happened and what emotions were associated with it and how it, you know, how they might have actually felt their life was threatened in the, in the heat of the moment. So yeah, it's, it's important not to overlook those sort of things and I think part of the reason I was so passionate about it was when I was a junior doctor we were, our average work hours were sort of, you know, 99, 100 hours a week and we had this doctor's mess and we'd all congregate in the doctor's mess at the end of the shift and we'd say, oh, I had this dreadful shift and three cardiac arrests and we couldn't find the Venflons and there was a really difficult intubation and we'd all just, we thought it was just a joint moaning session when we, you know, sort of be, be complaining about various conditions but actually it was therapy. We were, we were talking through our experiences and, and processing them and thinking about them and reflecting on them with other people. So um, yeah, that was a kind of informal example, but uh, in, in working life these days, I think it really should form part of um, any incident really. I think you need a 
All right, if you're rescuing a cat from a tree, fair dues, you probably don't need, but you know, anything where there's, there's a, a degree of you know, trauma and challenge, I, I think it's, it's helpful to have a debrief. And you, you know, I, I've personally been surprised with what's coming out with even minor incidents where you've thought, oh, I really didn't see it from that angle, or I didn't know that that was a trigger for you about you know, what happened before or what have you. So uh, yeah, I'm a big fan of the debrief really. I think it's, it's um, pretty crucial part of a healthy service. What would you suggest uh, like for officers or for anyone who, who hears someone express something that sounds like this, you know, what, what should they actually do about it? Yeah, so Tony, you're asking uh, what what um, uh, staff members should do if they if they uh, pick up symptoms which which looked like PTSD or, or could fit into the diagnosis. Um, I, I think the key thing is I, I certainly wouldn't try and approach it in a group setting. I think an individual um, uh, sit down with with the the um, uh, the person in question is probably the best uh, initial approach. Um, and you know the approach that we tend to take in uh, clinics is uh, again just sort of open questions. So how are you doing at the moment? Um, how are you finding work? How's home life going? So some nice broad open questions. Um, you may get a bit of a brick wall with people saying everything's fine. Stop asking me these weird questions. But just be persistent. Keep at it and keep coming back with more and more open questions. And eventually you can narrow it down to saying. You know, you seem quite on edge at the moment. Is that is that you know uh, something that's that's a, a, an issue for you? Um, one of the things that we frequently do when asking questions is normalising. Um, so this is uh, sort of uh, to helping destigmatise things. So often with young people, I'll say, a lot of young people that I work with mention hearing voices. Is that something that happens to you? So rather than saying, "Are you hearing voices?" the response might be. Are you implying I'm mad? You know, what a weird question. You, you, you do a bit of normalising and saying, look, this is, this is a common thing that people talk to us about. Similarly with suicide, with child abuse, you know, those kind of things. We'll, we'll do normalising and say, look, a lot of people mention this, this has happened to them. Is it something that's happened to you? So, um, yeah, I would, I would try and kind of open uh, in that kind of way if you can do. Um, and yeah, again, if there's a particular staff member that engages with that person very well, maybe have a chat with them and get them to do that, to have that conversation with them. Um, it's difficult, uh, especially if uh, you know, you're not used to asking those sort of questions, but that shouldn't put you off doing it. It's um, uh, because the cost of missing it, as we've said, is, is pretty major. Mm. All right. Well, listen, thank you very much, folks. Uh, thanks for your patience and for listening to me waffle on on a, a favourite topic of mine. And um, my, my contact details are on there, so if anyone does have any further questions, I'm happy to answer them via email. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Pleasure. Pleasure. <laughs>